Well, I think it's important, particularly for us, because I think we, we really need to continue to grasp this in this time, that while it's great to believe all that we've believed over the last few days and celebrate it, it's another thing to be able to proclaim it to others. And, you know, if we, if we don't proclaim it, then uh, we've really uh, uh, shortchanged ourselves and the people that we have the opportunity to. So in building a welcoming culture and building a, a way of life that's exciting is that we have to have Christ at the centre of our life and that if Christ is really the centre, then we will proclaim him and share him. Amen. See, anything you have a passion for, you will speak about. It doesn't have to be anything religious. It doesn't have to be Christ himself. It could be anything. You could have a passion for music. You will, you will um, display that passion for music to, with others when you meet them. Now, we have to be sensitive to that ab about how we do it. But we, if we don't have that, then we have really, we have to question some of the aspects of our Christianity. Because, um, you know, um, we have to question, is Jesus really the centre of my life? And is it evident that he is? Is my life still the same as it was when I met Christ 20 years ago? Unfortunately, I have to say for most Christians, except for the first few months, there's no change. I'm not, not speaking to you here, but I'm making a general statement. Perhaps Jesus may not be at the centre of our lives as much as we think if we can't proclaim him. So it's important we see what Jesus himself did in proclaiming who he was and how he did it. If we go to John 4 and say, jump to verse 10, you all know this story. Now, you know, this, this woman in the Orthodox tradition of the church is a saint. That means she just didn't vanish into out of space. She actually became a canonized saint. Um, her name was Saint Fatia, something like that. It means in light, enlightenment. And she brought her two sons and five daughters to the Lord. And they all were significant evangelists. The, you know the story of um, Billy Graham? The story of Billy Graham was that uh, there was a man who felt the Lord wanted him to have a, a week of evangelistic services. And he went day after day, people came. No one, no one gave their life to the Lord at all. And on the last day, this one man gave his life to the Lord. And that was Billy Graham. So when we uh, are speaking with someone, we have to understand that we're not the saviour. We don't evangelise. It's the Holy Spirit does the work. And when we, have, we might evangelise one person, but that person may be so significant that they will evangelise thousands. So we don't look at numbers. You know, I've got 10, you've got 20. The main thing, are we proclaiming Christ? It doesn't matter if no one seems to come because that's not my job and that's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's not our job. But we have to open our mouth and proclaim what we believe, which we do, all of us are believers here, and what we've just celebrated these last few days. So in this um, part here in verse 10... Um, the, uh, the woman, the Samaritan woman, as she's known in the Bible, 
said to Jesus, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? There's a question. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. The water that I will give him will be will become in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. A spring of living water welling up to eternal life. Now how's that spring going in you? Is it flowing? Or has it become a pool? Again, I'm not trying to uh, put any condemnation or hard you know, uh, on anyone. I've got, when I preach these, I have to preach to myself. But we have a lot of strengths here in this body. We have wonderful people like you. We have great worship. We have uh, uh, f- four generations that come here on a Sunday. The, 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 the things are being passed on. It's a multi generational community. We do extremely well in the uh, ecumenical way we do things here. Um, as we are, you know, by the grace of God, in a, in a sense, I hate to say this word, but a world leader in this area, what we're doing. But there are areas we need to still grow in. And, and, and one of the areas we need to grow in is to be more welcoming, to be more friendly, to, to reach out with the gospel. And, and, you know, in the early days, we used to reach out with the gospel a lot. And perhaps sometimes in the early days, we were a little bit brash. We didn't exercise that sensitivity. Um, and so there's been a reaction of being nice, which is fine. Jesus was very nice by the way, in the way he evangelized this woman. He didn't Bible bash her. He didn't shout at her. He didn't, you know, he, he, he was honest, you know, about the Samaritan Jewish issue, but he was respectful. He, he transcended here a lot of issues. Men did not speak to women. A rabbi particularly would not speak to a woman in public that he did not know. That was out. Jesus broke that rule. He was speaking to a woman as well. He was speaking to a Samaritan. And Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. They hated each other. Because the Jews considered the Samaritans um, synchronistic in their worship of Yahweh which they were because they had been mixed up by the Assyrians who took people away and then put other people there and so it wasn't their fault necessarily but it's interesting they were some of the most open people to the gospel of Jesus Christ sometimes you know those that have little are more open than those that have a lot. And so Jesus comes to her to reveal himself to her, but he does it in an extremely sensitive, respectful, good way without ever compromising anything that he's about. And that's, if you want a model of how to evangelise, read this story because in this story you will see how Jesus does it now Jesus was not looking for this woman Um, as far as I understand he didn't have a big word of knowledge or he was just passing because he was just getting out of it getting out of Jerusalem and he, he was passing 
could go back to Galilee. And the shortest way was through Samaria, but a lot of Jews did not go that way because they wouldn't go near the Samaritans. So he's just passing through and he's at the well. And another thing about this woman was that she came to the well at midday, which meant that she, there was something not right with her because the women came early in the morning. It's hot there and you come to get your water so you can do your cooking, your washing, all those other things early. Um, that's how they do it in these, in these cultures. But she was there at midday, which did imply that she had some social problems. And as we read the story, we realise she had quite a lot of problems. <laughs> a lot <laughs> of problems. But see, God can turn the most vile of sinners into the greatest of saints. Amen. And that's what he did. And, he, and this, wo and this uh, 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 Samaritan woman is a canonised saint in the Orthodox Church. I don't, I don't know why in the West we haven't we missed her, but they didn't miss her in the East. They're very sharp spiritually there. So, so this is what it means for us to evangelise locally and nationally. We have an opportunity, the women do at least, this week to invite someone. Uh, so this might be an opportunity for you and if you don't want to invite them directly, there are ways of asking questions. Like Jesus did. And then the Samaritan woman asks him questions too. So when a person, when you've prayed for someone, remember we're supposed to be praying for the one. If we all evangelise one, we'll have to build the building quicker. Um, because there won't, there's not, there's hardly enough room now. I know today is a little bit easier because a lot of people are away for the weekend. But we we would double in 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 one within a year if we all evangelised one person. And so we pray for the one. When we pray for the one, usually that one has questions, like the question that the Samaritan woman had for Jesus. She had questions. Now, we don't know if anybody was praying for her. We don't know anything about that. But Jesus meets her where she is. And then we jump to verse 29. Because I can't read it all. I don't have enough time. Jesus then sends these, the apostles to get some food. Now, he didn't need to send 12, really. <laughs> really, I mean, he only, he only needed to send two or three. But again, he, he was exercising sensitivity towards this woman. So he got the whole lot of them out the way. Because, you know, when you're just about to evangelise someone, you get that person that comes in with something, oh, no, I, I don't really want that person to say that. That's the last thing this person wants to hear. I've had that happen to me often. So he got them out the way, the whole lot of them, so that he could speak with her. And then we'll take the story from that point. They're coming back. Just then the disciples came back in verse 27. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. See, it was not on. But, one, but no one said to him, what, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? They were all a bit uh, afraid. They, were, they wouldn't have passed a lot of the uh, test of modern uh, management because everyone's supposed to express their view very strongly. But they were a little bit intimidated, it seems, by Jesus. And they didn't ask any questions. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? A question mark. A lot of questions here. They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. <coughs> so the disciples said to one another, 
Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplished his work. Do not say there are four months, then the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured, and you have entered into their labour. So Jesus here is speaking about that there is a harvest out there. There are souls waiting to come into the kingdom. And again, we mustn't forget this. While we don't judge people, we cannot judge who's in heaven and who's in hell. In fact, if you make that mistake, that, you're making a grave mistake. But it's still our responsibility to bring people to the kingdom. And there is still the possibility that people will go to hell without fellowship with God. And it might mean that we need to speak to them. Again, it's not our job to, to convert them. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But it's our job to speak. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the women, woman's testimony. He told me all I ever did. Remember earlier, I didn't read it. He told her to go and get a husband. And she said, I don't have one. He said, oh, yeah, you're, the one you're with is your fifth one or something like that. Um, and he's not your husband. That's right. So much for living together today. Um, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed for two days. That's quite incredible in the culture. These people were like, you know, I don't want to mention any groups today, but any, like any two groups today that are at serious loggerheads that they can't even play a football match together because otherwise there'll be serious injuries and death even. Hatred to the great degree. And this was um, incredible. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed is the saviour of the world. This is an incredible statement when a lot of the Jews couldn't get it who were learned and well respected. So don't, don't rationalise on the basis, well, I'll pick someone who knows something about God or someone who's religious because that doesn't work most of the time. It's, it's anyone, could be, could be not. And usually it's the most unlikely person like this woman was the most unlikely person that Jesus could evangelise. I mean, Jesus had even Pharisees evangelised, okay, Nicodemus and some of the others. So he, he, didn't, he didn't discriminate against anybody. So what did the woman do? She testified. Now that word in the Greek is the word we get martyr from. So a martyr is a person who, who, who testifies with his or her life. So when we testify, it's the same word that's used for a person who dies for their faith. It's the same Greek word. So when we testify, we're making known Jesus Christ. She said to the people, come see a man who told me all I did. Now in ministering to people or in reaching out, we may have a word of knowledge. We may have some supernatural knowledge um, in that process. And this is what people do when we go out to the streets. The important thing is, again, is how we deliver that. If we deliver that 
in an arrogant fashion, that will do no good. But if we deliver it, deliver it in a spirit of humility, then that could bring a person right open to God. So Jesus Christ comes to everybody, to all individuals, to all cultures, to all people, to all ages, to men, to women, young and old, the educated, the uneducated, the not so brilliant, the very brilliant. He wants to reach everybody. So there's no one that's really excluded. But when we pray for the one, then we're most likely to get an openness in that person. Now, we've had a word recently, which is very encouraging at the leaders, that people will see light in us. That actually, literally the word said, even if they see you at the shopping centre, They'll want to follow you because they see a light in you. Now that's a very encouraging and incredible word. When we speak, though, we have to have that light. Now we can't, we'll never be perfect before we can evangelize. So start evangelizing now, doesn't matter. However, when your life, when you've really changed your mind and your lifestyle, you will be more effective evangelism. See, if a, you, you, can, you can have a word of knowledge, but if you're drinking at the pub every night, that person's going to see right through you. Or we're still getting drunk or whatever. If you're, watch, if you're watching things you shouldn't watch and going to places you shouldn't go and seeing things you shouldn't see, then your testimony is going to be weakened because with your testimony has to go a change of mind and a change of lifestyle. Once we start in that process with God, seriously, then when we tell our story, people will know the truth. And we have to start to go public with our faith and giving testimony to our Christianity. Someone shared a story um, yesterday. I won't go into details and explain exactly who. But even in this country now, there are institutions who are trying to stop Christian people, Christian groups, from proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. If you want to know privately the story, I'll tell you the story. It's in this very city that that is happening now. So we better start now because it's not going to get any easier. And that's the way it is. That's the way God's allowed it to happen. Because we have uh, recently... I have a friend, we have a friend in Malta, a Catholic priest, and he sent me a, a, a message on, on Facebook about the um, Metropolitan of, Mo of Moscow who made a, a statement about the West and how we, we, we've become so decadent. We've lost, you know, in, in the pursuit of the right of the individual, we've let, this is what he said, something like this, we've let go of morality, of decency, of concern for other people, as long as my individual rights are met. And that's a really serious error. Yes, Christianity does come to give us individual rights. Does come, in fact, most of the freedoms that we have are due to Christianity. But it never comes at a, an expense of morality. And that's where we're in a serious problem. So Jesus should be the center of our life and it should be evident. 
you know, you don't have to even proclaim Christ. But recently I've, I've been able to engage in a couple of conversations at the train and outside a football match as well. Just doing something kind for people. The other day a woman fell over and she fell over very badly. And I went to help her. It's a simple, a simple thing. But she made some very um, po nice comments. Because people do see the light of Christ. It's very important that acts of kindness are not left out of our evangelism even if we don't speak about Christ himself personally. So Jesus should be the centre of our life, and it should be evident. And if he's not as central as we think, then we should reassess our life. This woman did not understand all. Jesus didn't give her the whole gospel, by the way. He didn't give her every theological Nuance. He didn't give out every theological understanding. We have far more understanding than this woman ever had at the time. But he shared himself. And all we need to do is to share Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. An atheist recently said, um, this is a quote, that he didn't respect Christians who didn't try to convert him. Because, obviously, they don't really believe in, in anything if they didn't try to convert him. All right, so just some points about Jesus' evangelism. Here you can take some notes if you want to if you want some tips. The first tip, of course, is the Holy prayer and the Holy Spirit. The second tip is proclaim Jesus Christ. There's no other alternative. But there are some skills, and these are some of the skills. One, Jesus was personable. He was interested in the woman. He asked her questions. People will guess quickly if you're just shoving Jesus down their throat and you don't, couldn't care less about them, they're not going to be respond. In fact, they'll have a more hostile view to Christ. So please don't do that because that's not helpful. Jesus was very personal, personal here. So whenever you evangelize, be personal to the person. Secondly, be kind and respectful. Respect people, whatever their beliefs are. You may not respect their beliefs or agree, but respect them and do it respectfully. Thirdly, ask questions like Jesus did. Fourthly, don't try to reveal everything. Don't try to give them the Apostles' Creed in one session because they won't understand it. You may talk about that later. Give them as much as they can handle. And usually if you see a person regularly, it's best to give them a little bit at a time. If you see once somebody once at an airport, you may give them the Apostles' Creed if you want to. <laughs> but you won't see them again. But give people a little bit. Don't give them too much. Jesus didn't give this woman everything. In that, Jesus did not try to reveal all to her. And, and the next thing that happens is, if you do it well, 
then the very person that you're trying to reach will evangelize more people than you will evangelize in them. Because usually they're not Christian, obviously, trying to evangelize them, and they have more non-Christian friends than you have and I have. And they will bring more people to the Lord. So that's how it works. Don't you try and evangelize everybody because you probably don't know enough people to evangelize. You evangelize the one and let them do the rest of the evangelization. And lastly, you don't know who you're evangelizing because that person may not only be a person who evangelizes their family but might be a saint or might be a Billy Graham. They might have great impact on the world. So you don't know. So they're just some of the things you need to think about. So on this day, which is the day we celebrate the finality of the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we need to make Christ known. We need to take the motto of the youth of the mission and that is to know Christ, which we do, and to make him known. So from this day, I want to see a different, a difference in this body. I want to see a priority in our life to bring souls to the kingdom because it's been a little bit of a weakness in recent years. It's something that we've been trying to work at, trying to improve. And that's why we're starting to put on things again, like this Saturday morning, uh, because that helps people. In the early days, my evangelism used to be simply this. I had a car which I bought for the purpose of evangelization. I didn't need this car. So there always has to be some sacrifice. For young people particularly, sacrifice, without sacrifice, David said, there, there, there is no prize in the long term. There has to be some price to pay. And I used to just pick people up and bring them to a meeting. I didn't know how to say very much. But I could befriend them and I could pick them up. So that's something that we can do. But I had, I had a culture of evangelization. I had a culture of reaching out. I couldn't do it, so I got a car and brought them to the place where someone else could evangelize them. That was just something that happened to me. It's important. Again, I'll finish with the quote, uh, with the, the uh, Youth for the Mission, um, this is their motto, to know Christ and to make him known. Should be our motto too. We know him, all of us here, but we have to make him known. 